Hey, you welcome to Do You Know What I Mean podcast. Today we have one of my good friends and a really, really good comic and actor and voice actor, Alex Law. Good to see you, Alex. It's good to have you on. Alex Law, who plays many characters in comedies, a voice actor, an actor, and a comedian. Probably, probably one of my favourite people in comedy. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. You are honestly from when I very first started. Watched you even from when I was younger in in shows like. Um, Phoenix Nights, and obviously you've been the very famous Mr. Watford. Barry from Watford, yeah. That's the one. Yep. Barry from Watford. Barry from Watford, I wasn't familiar with until I knew about you being on Phoenix Nights. How mm. did that come about? Uh, well, um, I used to do a show on XFM, now Radio X, you know, in the when you were very, very young, the 2000, sort of 2001, 2002 kind of time. And um, I always wanted to do uh, a character, create a character. And Barry, who is uh, a very elderly man, who talks like old companies, uh, used to talk in the old days, you see, uh, with not much lung capacity, you keep running out of the bread, you see. Um, it's based on all my old cockney ding-dong relatives. I mean, I know I sound middle class and posh, but uh, growing up, my, my lot are all from South East London. Yep. And during the war, you know, there was a move to get everyone out of, you know, they were right next to an armaments factory and all sorts of stuff. So they, they were encouraged to move into the suburbs and they moved to South Harrow. But they're all kind of cheerful, cockney, chumpy shopkeepers. <laughs> and uh, my granddad and, and all those people on the low side of the family were very much that old South East London uh, Cockney, they, they sort of. I mean, you do sort of hear that now, but you know, dialects change. A yeah, lot. yeah, of course. I mean, everyone, everyone's. I, mean, I think the internet's done that, hasn't it? I think everyone's into. What, everyone's change? trying to be more Americanized as well, aren't they? Everyone's I think. Well, you know, in the East End now, there's Asians and and uh, Afro Caribbeans and all that. You know, dialects change just depending on who's moved into that area. Yeah, yeah, of course. But um, yeah, I can't see my lot talking in American. All those Cockneys. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> you know so, so that's basically based on all my old Cockney lot. So when obviously obviously we'll talk about more Clinton Baptiste later on in the podcast, mm. but so you're like you're because you're an actor and people like I but I always call you a comedian because every show I've worked with you you're a comedian. I think you're a very funny comedian. You always call yourself an actor, which yeah. you, I don't know why you do that because for me I've seen you improvise, I've seen you do stuff that's like what comedians do. So. Are you classing yourself as a comedian yet, or what? What you? Well, I find increasingly, all I want to do is get up on stage and do my solo comedy stuff. Yeah, you know, it. it, it this sounds like, I don't know what it sounds like, but you know, it is like the crack cocaine of performing. Mm. There's you. There's a microphone. Invariably, it's it's material you've written yourself in your bedroom. Yep. And it's like there's no. Oh, I was. I quite like the design choice in Act Two. There's none of that. It's like, did I laugh? Didn't I laugh? Yeah, yeah. That's it. And you live or die by that. Hundred percent. And so it's a kind of real buzz when it goes right because you feel vindicated and you've written it and you feel like you deserve it. Um, so I be, would happily, happily kind of tour as Clinton Baptiste, for example, for the rest of my career. You know, and it's only now in my fifties that I've started to do that that anyone is remotely interested in anything I'm doing. I know, so, because, you know. You're saying, there's so many things, I mean, obviously, like you're saying with me, I mean, the first time I, I met you, I only knew you as Clinton Baptiste, until yeah. I typed your name in, and I was like, fucking How's hell. How's that he, bloke? He's, he's done the voice on Fireman <laughs> Sam. Yeah, I've you done Fireman like Sam for 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and like, so, with the voice acting and, and, and the acting as well, mm. did, how, what made you get into, what made you, what, did you always want to be an actor when you yeah, were younger? Definitely, definitely. So, at anyone like, what was your, what was your, um, what should I say? Not your heroes, but your sort of inspiration for doing that. Like, what made you want to become an actor? Well, I mean, you know, why does anyone want? To, honestly, the real truth is probably there's some deep seated psychological reason. Yeah. You know, <laughs> a need to be loved or something like that. I'm sure there's. If I if I ever went to see a psychiatrist, I'm sure there's some horrible dark reason that you know you're craving an audience reaction like you know i had an older brother maybe i always thought he was preferred 
to me. I don't particularly remember feeling like that. There's a lot of love for both of us. But, you know, there's always something that makes you want to show off as a kid. Mm. Why would that be? I don't know. You're sort of getting attention. My parents are very, very straight-laced. You know, sort of brought us up in a slightly, uh, probably a very old-fashioned way now, I would imagine. Um, but I just think, you know, when you're very young, it's just a question of showing off, isn't it? And then yeah, yeah. I think, you know, I grew up in northwest London, quite a nice middle-classy sort of area yeah. where um, there's, there's sort of drama lessons after school I went to. And friends of mine were going to these drama lessons. And when I was about 11, I found out about this thing. And I thought, oh my God, it's like, this is proper serious actor training after school. And my parents were like, you want to do what? Oh, well, okay, you know. And I went on to that, and I basically stayed in that from about the age of 11 to 18, mm. doing Shakespeare and doing, you know, poetry and verse and loads of comedy yes, improvisation. Yes, you learn, learn a lot. So yeah, you, and uh, when you're that age, you don't know you're learning anything. It's just a kind of fun thing that you do, and you soak it up, you know. And then I did a degree in drama, which was bloody awful at Leicester Polytechnic, which was just the maddest, most ridiculous, arty-farty bullshit, which mm. I spent my whole time thinking, this is crap, you know? Yeah, but you have to, like, you sort of felt like you had to have that behind you. I mean, yeah, I did agree. I mean, but, I mean, the difference between, I mean, I mean, I don't know if there is a difference between now with, would you say with acting now that sometimes, I mean, it's, maybe it was the same then, but sometimes people can get into acting from like, I mean, if you were to tell someone who was younger now, would you tell them to go down that route? Would you, or would you, like, would you advise it or, because I think it's a, obviously you're very well, good, it's done you very good. No, it's a very, it's a good question. I mean, I've been constantly I mean, people often ask about that. Would you go to drama school? Would you do a degree? Would you do nothing and just try and chant your arm as an actor? In a minute, folks, this is going to get funny. I know this is very, this is very worthy and boring <laughs> at the moment. Sooner or later, I'll say something funny. Don't worry. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so what, that's a very interesting question for anyone who's watching who might want to Yeah, perform. of course. Um, I think that really, I think if you want to be an actor, it's a really tough thing, but put your money where your mouth is, you mm. know, it's all very well, like, doing my terrible degree that I did. But I did a lot as I was a child actor. But I would say, if you're going to do it, don't particularly think about plan B. Go all out for plan A. Yeah, yeah, 100%. You know, well, you know when you're actually trying to make a living at it, you might want a little side hustle, a little another string to your bow sort of thing. But um, I think if you want to be an actor, it, it's or any sort of performer... Well, you know this. It's an absolute lifestyle choice, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, 100%. You, you have to dedicate... You know, I had to sell our honeymoon. I got a commercial. You won't remember, you're too young, but there was a thing we did for Dry Blackthorn Cider where we were these aliens with cone heads and we drunk out of the Dry Blackthorn Cider with our long fingers. And it, like, netted me um, tons of money, right? Yeah, in, in a long, long time ago. And it, it, it got us a lot of money and I, I, I had to postpone my honeymoon. Luckily, my wife was fine about it. But loads of things, loads of bringing up the kids, I often think, oh my God, I was away for that. Or I didn't take them on a weekend somewhere, which my wife took them on her own, because I thought there was something I was going to do which was going to catapult me into stardom. Mm. You know, so many things. And it's an absolute lifestyle choice. And what I would say is if anyone wants to do any sort of performing, you know, you have to, it has to be the one thing you want to do above anything else. If there's any question of you, you know, wanting to do, you know, if, if you th think for one second you can't take the hardship of it, don't even start because it's yeah. brutal. You that, know? That, it's good that you say that because yeah. um, with me, with a boxing background and, and when I used to do the boxing and, and it's, I suppose any sports star, football, boxing, even yeah. if you even if you I don't know, even if you're a darts player, I suppose, or yeah. any, if you want to be the best or you want to do something, you've got, it's got to become oh, yeah. first over everything. And yeah. that's what, when I realised when I'd done the comedy, it was when I'd quit all the boxing and stuff, yeah. I, I wouldn't have been able to do it then. I'd have been like, oh, uh, you know, I'm not into it. And, yeah. and that's what I realised when I first started doing comedy. It, it, I soon noticed that, hang on, if I want to make, I started making a little bit of money here and there. And then I, f I was thinking, I could make more money at this if, if I put it, if I do it as a job. Yeah. Yeah. And I put it, I write, I, I treat it like a job, go, go and write in a library. Definitely. Go and, 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 go and, and go and do stage time everywhere I can. Well, of course, James, people won't, the whole of society 
I promise this is going to get more entertaining in a minute. The whole of society is telling you not to do that, aren't they? Yeah, quite 100%. You know, you're doing what? Well, I, I, you're going to the library and writing a load of jokes? <laughs> Wake up, son. Go and get yourself a trade. You know? I, I, had a, I was a plaster and then I was, I had a, I was offshore. And I remember, yeah. I remember people saying to me, um, you're still working offshore? Like, the, you're still working offshore, son? You know yeah, that? And I was like, yeah. oh, uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm doing a bit of comedy. I'm doing these com-. And he's like, comedy? Just, oh yeah, do you know what I mean? And I was like, and then, then oh, like, tell us a joke. Yeah, man. <laughs> you're funny. Tell us a joke. Yeah, and yeah, that, yeah. That all the time. And but eventually, the start when when I start doing the bigger like the tour support and the bigger shows and even shows with yourself. I mean, one of the first ones was doing a show with you. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I, I, we'll talk about that in a second. It's really funny when I think back of that now because I wasn't as experienced. Um, but we'll talk about that in a second anyway. Yeah. Cause about when we met and um, but that was one of the first times when I put like a picture on social media with you. People were like, oh. It's that guy of Phoenix Knight. And they yeah. all say the same thing. And I know everyone asks you that same question. Are you getting yeah. the word? All the t- every time, yes, isn't yeah. it? Every- yeah, I mean, I do that a lot, having to, particularly for, you know, uh, memo, Me- cameo, yeah, celeb yeah. VM, you know, these dedication things. I, I have to look into the camera and call people a nonce. Now, <laughs> it is the ultimate insult, isn't it? It's it doesn't come any lower than that. <laughs> I always think, as a catchphrase, it's a bloody horrible catchphrase, you know. Uh, but you know, it, I thank God for Peter Kay. He's, he's, you know, it's a, it's a great thing that I've got any sort of catchphrase. But I always feel bad, you know, at calling someone a nonce, particularly into I, quite often for their birthday present on a dedication. You know, that's a nice one. The, the funniest thing about that you're saying that there. I mean, that nonce for me is my get out of jail card. And I think it's a lot of comics get out of jail cards. So if someone heckles them and you always get a laugh, it doesn't matter where you are. You could be in the, the poshest, most up class room you've ever yeah. worked or the most working class room. If someone heckles you and nine times out of 10, if you went off, oh, fuck off, you know, actually you're right. I don't use it enough. And funny enough, I was telling, uh, I was telling you earlier, you know, about just recently, you know, I'm so used to people being really nice to me on social media and I've just had a couple of haters Hate it, just you're making recently. It. Just recently, you're making it. And I and I I really it's really knocked me for six. So if you're out there, well done. <laughs> I hated it. It did the trick. It made me feel a bit sick for a while. So I've had a, just a few of these people coming out of the woodwork suddenly, and I think, you know, I don't do anything that's particularly horrible. But but one person says something like. Uh, yeah, we went to see him. I didn't think much of it. It didn't even it didn't even say the catchphrase. <laughs> and so, if you're out there, here it is: nonce. Happy, <laughs> happy. You know? I mean, didn't do the so, catchphrase. I, mean, so I, I can't. I mean, obviously, I, the, when I went viral with that video, and um, it's, we were talking about it in the car on the yeah, way, yeah. and it's. I mean, you pretend that you. I mean, so many people go, "Oh, yeah." When when you when you make it big, I mean, I imagine your McIntyre's, your Peter Kays, your Chris Rock or all them, they're all going to get Yeah, but they're never going to read it, are they? There'll be people to take care of them having to read this Do you stuff. think? Do you think they have a little... Do you think? I suppose some of it slips through the net. I mean, what happened was, we are employing Phil McIntyre Productions, putting out my tour, you know, always put out my tour. And uh, as I say, up to now, it's been great. But they've started to employ like a social media company. And somehow, on Facebook, I seem to be an administrator. So my phone, <laughs> it just goes, bing! all the time oh that's nice cheers you know and it just appears so i've now just turned that off i don't want to see any of that stuff and as i say you know literally 19 i'd say 99.5 percent of the time it's people are super super nice not necessarily because it's me it's because they love peter k and they think i've got no but you know you you, you, you say you put yourself down you you, i mean this is what we'll get to now i obviously you, you put yourself down with that. I don't think you're a great character. You're a great character as Clinton Baptiste. I mean, you've got to give yourself credit. You're in you're in that show for what three minutes? Was it three yeah, mi- something like that? Yeah, it's not and very it's long. The more, and it's the <laughs> but it's the biggest highlight of the show. It's it's it's, it's definitely. Liam, oh, well, it's I'm definitely, really, I'm it, glad about that. Yeah, it's the more. It is hundred percent the most. I, I'm I'm trying to think of any other. The, obviously, Max and Paddy are, are big in it. Obviously, that's Peter and, and uh, Paddy and yeah. But like, hundred percent. It's the most. It's the the most. Memorable, easily. Even when, even as a youngster, being in, in like everyone knows that. You say, "Oh, do you yeah. know Clinton?" Even if they said, do "You know Clinton Baptiste," and say, "Oh, which one's Clinton again?" Claire Vaillant or Phoenix Knight? Oh, yeah, I'm getting the word. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I'm really so grateful for Peter. I mean, how did that. that? 
I mean, we've spoken about before. How did that come about? Was that the Edinburgh Fringe? Where you're at the? I tell you what happened. He uh, came. To, I did a show in 1998. When you were, how old were you then? 19 what? Eight. 98. 1998. Yeah. I would have been at nine. Oh God. And you're old. Well, I was considerably older. I was 30. Uh, yeah, I was 30. And uh, Peter came along to review. It was about British wrestling, where I played. Big Daddy, Giant Haystacks, yeah, yeah. Mick McManus, all these people. There's a wrestler behind you. Can you remember him? Ultimate Warrior. Who? The Ultimate Warrior, that. Never heard of him. He was in the late 90s, was he? Yeah, it's, it's after my time, that. And um, it was a show where I played a fictional wrestler who was, you know, the idea was I was doing Edinburgh to raise money for me to go and fight in America. Yep. And I played all these people, Max Crabtree, Brian Crabtree, who were Big Daddy's brothers, who were promoter. One was a referee, the other one was a promoter. And um, Peter Kay came to review it with Bomber Pat Roach. You know him from Alfie Design Pat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who was a wrestler. He's a kind of brummy wrestler. And what happened was uh, Pat Roach, at the end of it, came up to me and went, uh, I haven't um, seen you on the circuit wrestling. <laughs> and I thought... Well, I mean, I know I said I was arrested, clearly, you know, just a conceit for the show. And so I looked to Peter, who went, you know, and then I said, no, 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 I'm, 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 not, I'm only an actor. I'm not really a wrestler and yeah. all that. And then there was a bit of a pause, and I myself said hello to Peter. And then Pat Roach went, I didn't see you at Tiger Ryan's funeral. <laughs> I went, no, no, <laughs> I can't tell him again. I'm not actually a wrestler, you know. <laughs> and then Peter, to this day... If I ever speak to him, will say to me, I didn't see you at Tiger Ryan's funeral. <laughs> and it's even in his book, Saturday Night Peter, where he has this whole thing about, I didn't see you at Tiger Ryan's funeral. But it was so embarrassing. It was like, and in the end, I just stopped saying I'm an actor and just pretended I was this wrestler. So, so that's what so, I Do you know when, when he said that? Was, had he watched the show? Was it afterwards? Did he watch Literally it? sat through the show. I was, I was just taking my bow and the audience left and those two were left. I said, all right. I, he's just seen me doing, playing all these different characters. Uh, were, you, were you in like were you in like wrestling I was shape? In, I was in no we were in wrestling, wrestling shape <laughs> I was I was uh, <laughs> I was in a tunic sort of thing I don't know whether it was it was a shape whether it was a wrestler shape but then um, <laughs> was he in wrestling was he like an ex was he a big guy yeah he was yeah a big massive guy yeah was he bomber Pat Roach yeah but then Peter so great you know we knocked around a bit at Edinburgh and then that year and he was I don't know that's where he won the Perrier or I'm not sure whether it was then, but anyway, he was doing gigs. I think he won it before then. And then he just asked me to do that Peter Kay thing where I play this character, Sparky. He played Sparky in the tuxedo in, in the, the, uh, in in the, was bingo, the bingo, hall? bingo hall. Bingo hall, yeah. And then he got me in again to play Clinton in that Jesus Christ superstar thing. Because Sparky, on, I remember, I watched I had that Peter Kay thing on DVD because that, that's when he had like Leonard on it and that and, and yeah, the yeah. ice cream man and yeah. not. But when you you play you played the character Sparky, you were a bit like his licky ass mate, weren't you? In it? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Like, yeah. Where you're like, yeah. like, like, like um, bigging him up to do stuff in it, and like sort that's of it. laughing at everything you're doing. That's it. That's it. And then one day in 1999, Peter phoned me up and said, "Have I got a part for you?" Which was uh, Clinton Baptiste. And so uh, we went and we sort of worked on it. I've still got a video upstairs, a VHS of the sort of workshop that day up in my loft, which would just be the most incredible thing. I'm sure there's a few of them so knocking around. When that comes across, like to you, well, sorry, when that comes across to you, when, when someone tells you to do that part, do you add to it or do you just have to do exactly what they've well, said? Well, I'm very happy to say that Peter was up for a bit of improvisation. Yeah. And in the final show, there's a couple of lines which are mine that I improvised on the day. I, I think the first time I met you, I said to you, when I, me and my brother used to laugh like, fuck when we used to watch it years ago, with the bit where, as soon as you walk out, the bit where you miss the step. It, it cra- little, lovely bit of detail. It's so, it, so funny, that, you know. like oh, that, good. That is such a funny thing, like, missing the step, like, is, <laughs> is just so much... <laughs> <laughs> like, it's that they're the type... They're, like, the sort of the details that you see on, on like, like Ricky Gervais with his David Brent stuff, you know, like, things yeah, that, like, tiny. like... They're the funniest bits. Of course, I mean, what I remember from the day was Johnny Campbell was directing it, and it was a really technical exercise. I, you know, I know this is very boring for people to listen to, but, you know, when you're filming that sort of thing and you want to be very creative and you want to do these little tiny moments, most of your thought is taken up with, okay, come in, pause, look at the camera there, look at that, and acknowledge this woman here, 
I mean, when it's all chopped together, you don't necessarily see that. Mm. There's all sorts of little tiny things. Hit your mark there when you're saying this line. At the end of that line, you know, turn on the final line, but only half turn. Try to catch that light. That Those are really technical things which so, uh, actors have to think about. Was that something like that? Is it shot in one or did you have to do quite a few shoots? We did quite a few. I mean, I mean we did all sorts of little bits, you know, a master shot and then a two shot and then a dirty Was there any... The was shot, there any the um, Funny outtakes when you said I'm getting the word. Did it, did that the first time you said I'm getting the word? Because obviously that's a very famous. Yeah, I'm getting I the- think that's. Pro- I think everyone was quite shocked by that. And that guy was, uh, was a massive guy who sort of yeah, had to yeah. lift me up. Do you still know him, or do you just meet him on that set? Do you know what? I'd love to know who that bloke is. I don't know who he is. If you're watching, if you're watching, please. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, I would love to know who he is, and I've tried finding out. And I know that the, there's another guy, John Al- Ansom, I think his name is John Alsom who is in that, you know, a mouth, you know, that guy yeah, yeah. and his wife. Yeah, yeah. I think he died sadly. Oh, that's sad. But uh, I was, for a while I was trying to get in touch with him, but I'm just sort of, honestly, I, hope- I mean, as I said to you, it sounds like that's the only thing I've ever done. I'm always no, it's talking not, about it's not, No, but like, obviously that is obviously, I mean, you, it's, it's what, in a way it did help make you with Clinton Baptiste. Didn't it, obviously. Oh, I'm delighted. And then, uh, uh, yeah. And then yeah. that happened, obviously. It was, was Barry after that? Was but. No, yeah, I did Barry in about, you know, 2005. And and to answer your question earlier about how Barry came about, I it was honestly a, as I was saying, I was doing XFM and Ian Lee phoned up. TV's Ian Lee used to present, present the 11 o'clock show. He's done lots of radio and stuff. And he phoned up with his character, Mike from Muswell Hill, yeah. which basically just sounded like Ian Lee yeah, yeah. with a very similar voice <laughs> and was trying to, you know, trick me or say something stupid on my show. And I just thought to myself, I really want to do this character based on my old Cockney forebears. Yeah, yeah. And I just sort of had this voice. So I phoned Ian Lee's show and, and Ian, I didn't know it was me and t- for, you know, the first five minutes. And then I just kept doing it on LBC and it was, and, and I'm not comparing myself to the great Peter Cook, but Peter Cook used to do that. Yeah. Phone up and be Sven, the Norwegian fisherman. Just, just because, this is probably goes back to what I said earlier, if you are desperate to perform, that is just something you do. It's just a thing you do in life. So, and yeah. so it was like, I'm going to phone up a bloody radio station and be a character. You, you know? when you're saying that, that means it's totally different. We used to do it. We used to ring people up when we were younger. Like when we were sleepovers, me and my mates, yeah. and just type a random number in. Yeah, I yeah, know. one four one. <laughs> I know we've done that. Oh, one four one, or one six four two seven 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 six four two or something random. Ring it one time. This is not even a lie. Sleeping at my mates Tom, and it was a few of us round, and we rang. And this is so shocking. This we rang a number, a random number, and, and a woman was like, "Hello." I was like, "You all right, ma'am?" And she was like, "David," or something like that. And I was like. I said, I'm, uh, I couldn't get a taxi. I said, and she was like, oh, David. She was, and I was like, and I'd already started. And I was like, yeah, I said, I've had a few drinks. Uh, uh, is there any chance of picking me up? Two o'clock, I'm outside quick save in Middlesbrough. And you don't, bastard. Don't get me wrong. This shows her I'm a nice guy about, and she was ready to go and pick him up. I rang her up five minutes later saying, it's okay, I've got a taxi now. So she'd have woke up the next morning. Like, so I rang the r- number on a redial. <laughs> She'd have woke up and probably spoke to his son and said, was there any need in ringing me up? And he'd have been yeah. like, Mama, yeah. I didn't even ring you. you know what I mean? So to so this day, she thinks... I don't know who it was. And then another one was, this is even better, my mate got sacked from a restaurant called Crayfawn Hall and the chef was really nasty. Nasty when we were, He was only 15. You know, we were 50, this is how old I was, I was 15, yeah. I have grew up. So I was 15 year old. So I rang his restaurant up and pretended to be his dad. Now, his dad's very middle class. He lives in a really nice area in Eagles Cliff near Yarm. Um, and his dad speaks very, very much like uh, th- th- this. Thomas, Thomas, come on. He speaks like that. And he'll, if he watches this, he'll start laughing because his dad does speak like that. He's like, he's like, oh, hello, James, how are you? You know, and um, so this chef had sacked him for not pulling his weight as a pot washer or something when he was 15 year old. So I rang the restaurant and said, I'm going to pretend to be his dad. And my mate was crying, laughing like that. With his head in his hands, me and my brother were there. And I said, Oh, here it's uh, Tommy's dad. Like that. And, yeah. and so he's bearing his mind, it's more funny because his dad speaks like this. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, I was like, There's a chef there, the head chef, Alan, or something like that, or whatever his name is. And she was like, Oh, just go and get him. So I obviously knew that he'd sacked him. And he came on and I said, uh, How are you doing, kid? All right. 
And he went, oh, hi, 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 mate. Yeah, uh, basically, he's not being pulling his weight. I said, well, fucking, I'm going to fucking knock fuck out of him when he gets in. And the chef's bottle started going that much. Mm. I was going, we've been brought up on a farm, mate. I said, I mean, he's a good lad. He, he, he's, I mean, he was bench pressing the, the younger calves when he was 14. Yeah, yeah. And I was just coming out with all this random <laughs> stuff to the point where we were all crying, laughing. In the end, he offered him his job back. Right. Because he thought his dad was going to knock fuck out of him. So he thought his dad was a lunatic. I think he'd done like two more shifts and then and then he just stopped. The, you know? the, the worry about doing that stuff is if you, you know, you imagine if that old lady had got out in the car and had a I know. car accident. I know. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> okay, you know, talking about putting a downer on it, but that's how my mind works. <laughs> keep it light, keep it light. Everyone. That's how my mind works, though. It yeah. does work like that. I always think, like, yeah, something like that could happen. I've, I've done. I used to do. Um, I used to when I worked offshore. I used to because it was always a one for one. We used to ring up ads, you know, out the newspaper. Yeah. You know, like uh, that's my bike and all that. Oh yeah, you yeah. know, like and then they say that like, you're selling the mountain bike. That's my ads. And he's like, and they'd argue back. And I always found that if you rang the, if you went on the, um, and this is no offense to any from Liverpool, anyone from Liverpool. Oh Christ! What's it's that? not not if you ring the area code of Liverpool to prank. And I'm not telling everyone to prank people here. But if you ring, they'll always argue with you. Scousers will always argue with yeah, you. Yeah, they'll yeah. always argue with no matter. <laughs> you are? Who the fuck are you talking to? <laughs> and they're so aggressive, you know, when you're like, hey. You know what? We did, this was a terrible moment, in, in Liverpool. And once again, to all our friends in Liverpool, love the Scousers. I kid you not, I've had the best gigs there. Yeah, Liverpool's great. Lovely, great for, for a crack. But um, we went there, Dan and I... Now, first of all, the one thing I want to say about this, when I toured Clinton in Liverpool, they're so loyal oh, yeah. to their own, their own people. Yeah, they love it. And there's a bit where I, um, as Clinton, I mention uh, Derek Acora. Yeah. And one of the last show, no, the first show I did, it was like a tribute to Derek Acora. I don't say anything nasty about Derek Acora. And his name came up and it suddenly went quiet and a voice went, come on, Clinton, you're better than that. <laughs> Long live Derek. <laughs> Now, Derek was dead, but so long live Derek is fine. But when I had to stop and go, and I'll take the piss out of <laughs> Derek Ikara, give us a chance, you know. But then um, the other one, which was really, I mean, God, I suppose it's just because people are casually racist about Scousers. Yeah, yeah. But we went and did a show, me and Dan Skinner, uh, Angelos and Barry, you know, we do a double act. He plays Angelos, Epithemia, and I do Barry from Watford. And we do a great podcast, if you're interested. Um, and there's a bit in the show where uh, Dan says, you know, this bit, I can't do the accent. It's been a lot, it's been happening over the last few years. Who would have seen it? Brexit, uh, Donald Trump in the White House. But the one thing no one saw coming was Dion Dublin on Homes Under the Hammer, right? <laughs> no one could predict that, right? It's a great game. And it got a huge laugh. It was followed by me as Barry going, oh, that's right, you like your day time telly, don't you? <laughs> Ever thought about getting a fucking job? And we did that up and down the country to big laughter. We got to Liverpool. The moment I said, Ever thought about getting a fucking job? <laughs> Silence. So it killed it. It absolutely killed it. And I wanted to stop and go, look, it's not about you. It's just, just because it's such a sort of awful, casual, nasty yeah. stereotype yeah, you yeah, know, about, about the Scousers. Yeah, yeah. And so they're just so bloody d defensive about that. I the felt bad of, about it. Once, once you've got them on your side, though, the loyal and... You know, we played the Hot Water Club the other yeah, night. Yeah, it's lovely, lovely. Oh, my God. And, and I was thinking our show doesn't really fit the Hot Water Club. But, I mean, you know, doing the show I'm touring at the moment with uh, Lewis McLeod, Clinton Baptist versus Ramon, you know, it's like a proper stage yeah, uh, yeah, it's thing. Yeah, it's a theatre show, isn't it? We're down the road tonight. In the in, Billingham uh, Forum. In the Billingham Forum. Lovely, huge stage, that stage there. And um, so the show is kind of a big, expansive show. And we got to the hot water club, and we're thinking, oh, my God. Because you have how, to climb over people to get yeah, on, on the stage, do don't it? you? How, yeah, you can't even get on the bloody stages. Clearly just meant for one person stood there with a mic. And we were just really dreading it. But, you know, first of all, they get comedy, I think. Yeah, that's great. They, you take a laugh machines on, isn't it? In yeah, there. beautiful. And then secondly, they, they it, it just kind of worked because it was intimate. And they're a comedy audience, you know. To be fair, we found that it's also in glee clubs up and down the country. Yep. Not the biggest stage. 
and the stand. You know, I played Edinburgh. But if you go to and do your show in a, a purpose-built comedy club, I mean, I'm speaking to you because you mostly play comedy clubs, mm. but I'm sort of so used as an actor, uh, you know, as a, you know, doing sort of sketch comedy style, you know, th- more theatrical show, which isn't just stand-up character comedy, yeah. that if you go into an, a proper stand-up gaff, you get people who really kind of appreciate its comedy. Yeah. They're not just turning up to their local civic theatre going, what's this, what's this, what did you get tickets for? <laughs> you know, we, we couldn't get um, the touring Swan Lake, so we've come to see this twat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like people who are there because they like comedy. Yeah, yeah. And, but, the, and, the, and the Scousers love comedy. I think it's such a, you know, until you start, learn, you learn on the way in comedy, until you realise that as well, like when there's so much... It's so much easier to play a room that's low ceilings, oh, yeah. a light on the stage, a dark room, and like and oh, like a good mic. And, and I didn't realise. I mean, are you using the cordless? You'll have to use a cordless mic, do you? We use cheap mics, and then we use a cordless, you know, handheld mic. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, yeah, I sometimes don't like them cordless mics. I, I don't. There's, there's, there's some, I like what, the ones. Got, that, I don't know. Why? Just, they cut out a bit more. Yeah, they seem to cut out quite Sometimes, a bit. Sometimes, yeah. You know, when, when you're on... Um, I'm, I'm here pref- to tell you, Jim, the bloody... Uh, it's the bloke at the back going, who's this clown? Yeah. In your case, it's <laughs> fucking whipping it down. Yeah. I do the, it my hair. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Most of this, it's just me going... <laughs> <laughs> so when, obviously, you, you'd done the, the Phoenix Nights with the um, like Clinton Baptiste... Was it straight after that? Did you start getting phone calls to do Clinton Baptiste? Is that how it no, happened? No, i tell you what happened. Uh, we did Phoenix Nights Live in 2015. Yep. I was doing a play in the West End, uh, Fatal Attraction. Remember yep. the film? So we did a play. Is that the Bunny Boiler one? Yeah. Yeah. So I was playing uh, the main bloke's mate who keeps saying, God, well, you know, you want to get in there, you know, yeah. she fancies you. Uh, and it was a lovely part. and It was a great show. And... Out of the blue, Peter Kay phoned me in my dressing room. I thought, oh, God, life couldn't get better. I'm in the West End. Peter Kay's on the phone. Uh, I went off and he just said, look, we're going to do for Comic Relief uh, Phoenix Nights Live. Uh, would you revive Clinton? And at the time, he sort of said, we might tour it. We haven't toured it since. But we, I went to Manchester Arena. It was, to try and explain to you, I've never known nerves like it because, you know, we had like a day's rehearsal Mm. the day before in, in Wakefield in a massive sort of hangar. And because, we, you know, this is the nature of comic relief, you know, there's no time or money to rehearse with the actors. Everyone yep. was doing it for free. And we sort of turned up there and we were sort of quite confident. I hadn't really rehearsed it much. And suddenly you see this place is like, you know, 15,000 seats. Yep. And you think, oh my God, we're not ready. How can we perform in this huge venue? So I was very, very nervous. I was sort of under the stage and it's the sort of nerves, you know, where your uh, lip is stuck. Yeah, to your, yeah, yeah. So dry, dry, dry absolutely out, yeah. terrified. And I your legs feel like they're going. Yeah, yeah. Roars. And there's a couple of blokes down there with, with you know, earmuffs going, uh, you know, ear protectors. Right, uh, Alex, get in, get in the cage, get in the cage. And I sort of come up through the floor to this arena, dry ice. It's like an out of body experience for you then, though, isn't it? Once you're on, once, oh. it's like like as if like you, it's not you yeah. performing. Someone's watching you. Well. Perform- Absolutely. And and the other thing, what I'm happy to say is there was an auto queue down there. But of course, as you know, I go into the audience. So I couldn't so rely how, on the how auto did queue. You do the, how did you go into the audience in an arena? Like, because I always I, I I sprinted did. across the stage and went down. It was, it was, there was, you know, it's quite a long way. But of course, there's, there's cameras. There's cameras and you're appearing on a. Because the, fir- foot the high. first time it was in lockdown, the first theatre I'd done was during when, the, when they started easing the lockdown rules when they were. It was there was about seven hundred people in that. Um, obviously, no went near as big as an arena, but the two thousand seater in Blackpool, Blackpool yeah. North Pier. Yeah, yeah. It's like a big room, and obviously, I was used to working intimate comedy clubs all the time. Yeah, yeah. I'd never had a massive light on me at the time, so obviously, when they were doing all running through the the sound checks, I remember them saying, "How light? How do you want the room?" And then they went, "This is how." Um, it's going to be for you when you're on stage. And it was like, boom. And I was yeah. like, and I was like, and I was like, can't see anything. <laughs> no, no. And then I went to move forward and he was like, oh, they won't see you if you're there. Cause you're not in the light. And I was like, oh, all right. Yeah. Okay. And I wear glasses and I don't wear glasses on stage. And I'm thinking, fucking hell. And I remember, and everyone had masks on when I went out, like, because, and they were, oh, it was horrible. That was the first yeah. time I'd ever done a feat. It was, a, and then I got used to it, but it was lockdown. So everyone was spaced out in different places. Oh God, it's and I was getting heckles. It was like heckles of whack-a-mole. 
no like heckles because they were daring yeah. to heckle because they weren't sat near anyone right, right and um right i remember yeah. at the time thinking oh is this what these bigger rooms are like this is shit you know like and then and, but then i ended up doing st helen's feet and not long after and it was when it was we were allowed to sit next to each yeah. other again and um that's much easier isn't it? and it was st helen's royal you know, yeah, you've done it, you've done it the yourself. other week yeah lovely yeah. theater and it was like and then now they've, it's weird because you do like like billingham tonight is actually a big theater what you're playing tonight but you obviously you've played a lot bigger venues and you go to them sometimes and when you stood there it doesn't look as big as it used to look you know when i go out now when i play the bigger yeah the big room sometimes i'm like oh it doesn't look as big as it and the reason i'm saying this is because i've done saint helens twice yeah the first time i done it i thought whoa this is big and then the second time i went back i was like oh this is small compared to what we've been doing i think um also it sort of depends what mood you're in at the time and it sometimes you feel very brave and all that yeah and yeah it's nothing it's just part of a run of things we've done. And other times you're going, oh God, I'm not really feeling this. Yeah, because like, do you prefer, what did you prefer? What do you prefer? Do you prefer playing a big, because- you know what? And the reason, sorry, I know I'm, I'm interrupting there right. going on, but the reason I'm saying it is because I was watching a podcast with um, like Tom Segura and Burke Kreiser and that talking on it. And they were saying, he's doing these 15,000 seaters. And he was saying, but when he records his DVD, he records it in like a, a smaller room. Yeah. You know, like he like he have like a, his, his preferred room, and Jimmy Carr talks about it in his book. He says his preferred room is something like I think it's about two thousand seats. I think it's in his book. I don't know if I've watched it before, but yeah, he says no more than twelve, uh, twelve hundred or two thousand. He prefers that's his his best room. Whereas he yeah. said a fifteen thousand, <clears throat> the arena can take away the the atmosphere of well, comedy. Let's be fair. I'm not used to playing fifteen thousand. <laughs> no, seats. I know, but I did it for like three weeks. Well, how did you feel doing it? Did it was it was it? Hard? It was really, really, really thrilling. The only thing is, and and as a comedian, you'll understand this that you can give a joke and that it's a slightly delayed reaction. Yeah, which yeah, affects your timing a bit. Yeah, it means pausing a bit more to see what the reaction is. You know, if you're in a little tiny room, you get an instant reaction. Yeah, yeah. But it can, tends to sort of rumble back. You know, the the response. Um, I mean, 2,000 seats. I mean, I, we play like 1,500 seats, yep. uh, which we don't fill quite, but it still feels like a bloody huge venue and, you know, we've got quite a lot of people in there. Uh, that I find quite daunting. I mean, Jimmy Carr is operating on a different level. You know, if he if he feels that 2,000 seats is sort of intimate, more intimate, <laughs> that that would freak me out, 2,000 seats. That's like the London Palladium size. It's, it's, but I think he was saying it as in obviously saying arena comedy he doesn't find and i think a lot of comics and i think you'll probably agree as well so like what you're saying that doesn't feel as just what you've said there is intimate like no you're playing right. a smaller room i but then sometimes i mean like you say it must be the mood you're in because sometimes i'll go into a room yeah that's a like a, a show when you're going to try material and there's 50 people in there yeah and they're right in front of you and you're not on a stage yeah and sometimes they can make you feel more nervous yeah, yeah and you're like absolutely fucking hell but, this, like they're here they're, they're right there whereas in, on, you're on a high stage yeah. you're like i can fucking run off i <laughs> really uh, yeah <laughs> I really, <laughs> if, I die, if i die yeah i really like the there's things i like i love that feeling of being in the wings in a big theater yeah. And you're sort of in the dark there and it kind of feels kind yeah, of yeah. magical and exciting. Definitely. And you just step out on that threshold and there's a sea of faces. That's kind of exciting. Uh, in fact, it's made me feel a bit sick with nerves now because I've got to go and do it in a bit. Oh, you'll smash but, it. You, um, always, you always do. I and mean, then the, but what I do like to answer your question, you know, that low ceiling thing. Yeah, yeah. If you've ever played, and if anyone's watching this, B, uh, uh, Wayne B's Beesness. It's in Stourbridge in the West Midlands. He has set up this club. When you go in there, you will really appreciate it. It's low ceiling. There's a bar right there. The audience are right up close. And it's got that hot water Liverpool yeah, feel yeah. to it. Right in front of you. They're comedy people. They like comedy. They've mm. gone out to see comedy. They're not like, you know, someone's done a bit of comedy in their church hall and they're going, let's give it a go. They know that this is a comedy club. Yeah, yeah. And I really like that. They're prepared to listen. They're kind of aficionados of what's funny. Um, so that, I love that. The Cookie Club in, in Leicester. Yeah. Low, sweaty, sort of formica. Well, not formica. What do you call that? You know, that sort of polystyrene yeah. ceiling. You know, it's kind of low and it's hot and it's boozy and it's funny, you know, and it's hot on the stage. I love that. I love that sort of feeling. Um just thinking there when you're talking about when you said the club the places where like obviously people aren't there to see you as comedy the first time i met you yeah 
was because I've, I've done a gig with you in the Longlands Club. Michael Hill booked me. The Longlands, yeah, yeah, and, in Middlesbrough. Uh, and I'd already started doing comedy then. But before I'd even done comedy, when I was still just working, I used to go on the internet and do this daft character with a wig on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Called Jeff. Jeff, I don't even do it no more. I had about 4,000 followers on the page and I just binned it off. It's still there if I wanted to bring it back. And I just thought, oh, yeah, Clinton's coming down. I'll just go on as this Jeff with no material. <laughs> with like, do you know, like no material at all. Like I had nothing. Like there was no, and everyone was there to see you. You know, like everyone was there to see Clinton Baptiste. He'd sold it out. There was about 250 people crammed into this, this social club, like to see Alex, like Phoenix Knight. And uh, like the, oh, the star from Phoenix Nights, and I was on the bill plus <laughs> Jeff Williams, right? <laughs> and when I met him, I didn't know him. I was like, oh, when am I going? And I remember thinking, fuck, you know, what am I doing here? Like, <laughs> and 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 I was, I remember, I think I said to Mick, I think I said to him, like, you think I should just go on and do comedy? And he was like, nah. He's like, they'll get yeah. the Jeff Williams crack. He's like, do a song. You do these daft songs. I was doing these daft mad bingo nights with him at the time. So I remember there was like an older audience in there at the time and and I just went out and like interrupted you after through because I told you I was going to and it just... Is that it what just, you did? Yeah, I told you I was going to. And did I just, say, and, yeah, fine, come yeah, and interrupt said, me. Yeah, do it. Uh, towards the end of me, give God, me... God, I'm nice. Me. I don't think I'd say that now. And you were like, give, just give us... No, it was towards the end you said, come in. So I was meant to be rude and just going... And in my head, I had this big image of like, I'm going to... <laughs> <laughs> to me, and it's gonna get this huge laugh, you know. Like, but instead, it was like because I had a tracksuit on, and and this, I think people just thought some piss head had got a a <laughs> wig on and glass. And I was like, I was like, yeah, I watch this shine here because I saw, and you were like, and you were like, fucking Clinton Bob James, and people were like, fuck this guy, and I went hit the track, and then the DJ put a song on that. It was like people like 50 plus old in the crowd and I was just rapping, <laughs> talking about shagging and you know, it was... Was I not, still stood on the stage listening to this? And like you'd walked off and then and then you went in the back room and then I'd just done like a set of <laughs> of nothing, you know, like calling people nonsense and <laughs> fucking, oh, is that, oh, that nonsense, you know? And it was, there was like young lads laughing, you know, like thinking what the fuck's going on? And well, I think that was the day he officially retired and he'd done one show and then I thought, <laughs> fuck that. So for me... I know now, just from that little bit of experience, how important it is. If you're doing character comedy, you have to, it has to be acting, doesn't it? It has to be, to perform, it must, you have to, obviously you've got your improvisation, which you do. Yeah. But you have a spine where you've got like, I'm going down this, I've got my stuff there that I'm going to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I probably am the wrong person because I absolutely script so much of it. And I'm very painstaking about this word instead of that word and, you know, uh, all that stuff. So it might look, I mean, I do have to do a lot of impro. I've seen you improv. You, you, I do you, a lot you of always, impro. You now. always say this to me, innit? <laughs> yeah. I've seen you improv loads. I've seen you improv so many times. I mean, I must have gigged you nine, ten times. Yeah. And every time I've yeah. seen you, I've seen you improvise. Do you need to answer that? Or? No, no, it's my lad. I'll right, phone so. him in a bit. And um, I've, uh, I've watched you and I thought that was good. Like, and I know for a fact you've definitely improvised it because I've yeah. seen you eight times before that and I've never seen you do it before. And then you come off stage and you go to me. And also, and this is not me kissing your ass, this is me just telling you as a mate, you're a really funny person in real life. You've, you've got... Not on this fucking evidence, I haven't been, have I? <laughs> no. I keep wanting to see you do Alex Law, stand up as Alex Law. That is what Law. I'm going to do one day. And I'm going to be 55 before long. And I keep thinking to myself, you better hurry up and do it, Alex, because you're not going to be able to remember any of it soon. And are you writing for it all? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm writing for another Clinton tour and I'm writing my podcast and I prepare meticulously for that. Um, but I will, I'm, there is going to come a time when I'm going to just do Alex Lowe stand up. Um, I mean, what I want to do is write stuff that makes me laugh. I mean, Clinton is not necessarily my favorite type of comedy you know i yeah. know it has a certain market and i i mean you know there's a lot of poo bum willy shit fuck bollocks piss that i do yeah and that does make me laugh yeah i mean yeah. i'm not i'm not particularly <laughs> clever uh, but i've been in lots of radio for i always think this you know i've been in ton, i've been in every bloody radio four comedy you can name and i've had a series on radio four yeah and i've done lots of shakespeare and all that and still <laughs> poo bum willy uh puerile double entendres make me laugh yeah yeah of course. but it's not necessarily you know if i if i really could choose i would be sort of harry hill 
But I just can't, my mind doesn't work in that way. It really makes me laugh, that really great, slightly warped, surreal that has one foot in reality. You know, you go, I kind of see why that's funny. You know, it's it's just a slightly mad take on something. I wish I could do that, but I'm just a very kind of normal suburban bloke, and I my mind kind of works in a very linear way. So I'd love to do something different. So what I want to do is write as me. What kind of interests me is a 55 year old bloke, but make sure it's not. Oh, and it funny getting older. (laughs) Oh my. Honestly, do anyone have this? My back, yeah, we all have backaches. Like, ugh. yeah, yeah. Yes, everyone gets older. Ha ha, fucking ha. You know, it, I want it to be really a really insightful thing, uh, but I don't know what that is yet, and I don't know whether that's going to make anyone laugh. No, it will. It will. I know from just having conversations with you, some of the stuff that me and you yeah. have had conversations in yeah. in private about a funny as. Um, <laughs> And even just like the stuff we were talking about on the, like on the way up in the car, like like it, it, it's it's the first, the I main Barry from Watford's probably the prime example for that with you when you're saying, and Barry from Watford, um, David Brent in the office, like them type of characters are from real people, aren't they? Like, yeah. So like, and I think that's how your comedy as yourself will be because you you never stop like finding something funny. Like, so yeah. I will make something funny out of anything without meaning to. Yeah. Someone will say yeah. something and I think that's funny. That and, I, and sometimes someone will be having a conversation with me in Tesco, the cashier, and, and, I, and, and I'll be getting me stuff and I'll, I'll be thinking, that's really funny what she's just said. Well, you are you are braver than me. I mean, you just said that you went up on stage during my thing with that half-baked character with no material. Oh, yeah. Now, that's not only brave, it's stupid. Yeah, it's stupid. <laughs> but I've done, I do that with, with comedy. Like, sometimes I... I when I definitely when I MC when I MC when you've seen me MC Lords and when I MC I have no material in my head. And that, I take my hat off to you for that. That's what I'd like to do. But what I was going to say was when you say you know you can make something funny out of nothing, that's fine. But having the balls to do that with an audience, uh, the, the more the more the, the bet without being a big head, the better I'm getting, and the more known I'm getting is the more nervous I get to try stuff now. But when I first, oh, really? yeah, yeah, yeah. When I first started, when I wasn't getting paid and when I wasn't doing it as a job, yeah, and I didn't care about going on there and thinking, oh, this might bomb, yeah. But now I feel like, oh, I need to let everyone know this would be me trying stuff. But then sometimes, because I used to go on some of Frank's shows and, and I think, oh, I'll try this tonight. I'll try. I'll, I'll I'm going to just try it, it's, uh, and it'd be in a theatre, and I'd be, yeah. and I'd be, and it'd work. And sometimes it'd be all right, and I'd and I'd just divert to something else if it didn't work. I'll call someone a nonce, and then I yeah. go, no, no, yeah. no, no, and then I'd get them back. Um, <laughs> No, I know. It's, that's the, I'm really not good at, at trying new stuff. I, I really hate doing it, and mm. I will back out suddenly. But I think I think it's good to write on stage. I think a, a lot of comics do that. I definitely do that with, like, I think, oh, I'm going to, like... What do you mean? I have just a basic idea and then write the joke as you're saying it? So stage. I had a joke. I'm not going to tell a full joke now about... Um, buying a cheap chicken from Morrison's before and, oh, yeah. and, and then I thought I'm going to do that on stage because it was funny because it had been reduced and I just thought I, I can make I've that heard fun. it yeah so I, so I wrote it down and then I done it and I've carried on doing that and I thought there's something else um, I can add to that I've watched yeah, it over yeah. and thought nah so then I'll write I'll add bits to it there's little bits like the Geordie joke that I do um, on, on stage I've added to that like saying or like saying that I'm not a Geordie I'm a smoggy even if someone had a gun to my head a yeah. knife to my neck and some scissors to my balls. And then I added this bit to it and I said, because they've got free hands and I'm pretending to be drunk. But that was never in it before. But every time I say that now, it gets this daft laugh because I'm, yeah. they're imagining me being drunk, saying it, yeah, like yeah. having an argument with someone and, and being drunk and saying, because they've got free hands. Cause I'm, yeah. And I always think, sometimes you think, oh, I'll keep that in. and then But then at the same time, I've done things like, I went to Wales, I'd done a in Cardiff and I'd done a joke that I'd worked all the time around England um, about the bins in England when you, yeah. when you wake up and you forgot to take the bin on the morning and you're running after the bin man and all. And then I'd done it in Wales and it got fuck all. <laughs> like, like, yeah. like, like nothing. <laughs> like, like When I say nothing, it, and it used to be my end joke, and it, like, I'd only done it maybe 11 times and it had got like applauses. Really? Why, why, why was that? And I, the, the punchline of the joke was a bit shit. It was cheap. It wasn't, it was about putting grass in the bin, you know, like, like where you're not meant to put grass in the bin and, yeah, yeah. and saying, you chase after this bin man and, and at the end of it, like, you start licking the bin man's ass about as if he's just performed heart surgery on your mother yeah. and like like saying, oh, thanks so much for taking my bin. I'm sorry for missing. <laughs> and the bin man's dead smug and he says, all right, son, um, 
just don't do it again. <laughs> and then I say, oh, it, it goes out. And then I say, oh, don't worry, mate. And I won't put fucking grass in it either. Like, and it got this laugh because around the area, people used to kick off saying you can't put grass in the bin and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I've done it in Wales. I don't know if they don't do it. And they're just like, 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 what it was do you like, say something about grass in the bin, is it? It's <laughs> a load of crap. <laughs> and I was just like, I've been just killing him. Good night. <laughs> you know? And you know, you can feel yourself go, I'm thinking, fuck it. But like, now I wouldn't have ended on, like, if I, if that happened to me now, I'd think I've got to end on a laugh. I've got to end on a laugh. I've got, now yeah. I, have, I have got jokes that it's probably the same as you, where I know that, I know it sounds big headed, but I know 99.9% nine, .9 they are going to get a laugh. Yeah. Like that is, yeah. even if I've not done so well, that joke at the very end is going to pull me out of it and give me a big laugh. Yes. Yeah, I do have that. I do but have I, that. I watched a comic, I won't say his name, and a, a gig a few weeks ago, and I, a gig that you've done as well, a very, very famous comedy club. Oh, yeah. Um, if you want to say his name, I'll be Oh, yeah. So we were playing, at, uh, I was playing. Yeah. Um, there was a comic con, I can't remember his name. And he was great at the start. Um, he was fantastic. And he was doing like three or four minutes of smashing it. And then he just started dying. And like, I was like, so I sat in the back. I was like, because when he came out, I was like, whoa, this guy's good. Yeah. And then he started dying and he was doing like, like stereotypical jokes about himself and being a geek. He said, I'm not going to say his material because I don't want to be nasty to him. Um, and it was like very cheesy jokes and, and the audience weren't getting it. And at the end of his set, he said, um, it was so funny. He said, uh, who's your favorite pedophile? <laughs> To the crowd. Oh God! <laughs> and it was like, "Whoa, is he going for the shock factor?" Yeah. And and like I was watching, and like I was thinking, "Why has he done this at the very end? Surely he's got a banger here." I said, "Go on, mate." He went, "I'm fucking talking to you. Who's your favourite paedophile?" And the guy in the crowd went, "What's your name again?" <laughs> and the place erupted. <laughs> you know, like like the biggest laugh of the whole night was from this guy in the crowd saying, "What's your name again?" And I was even, I was like, "Oh no!" And then he just like went off. You know, like, but he ended on a laugh. Yeah, bloody hell! But you you have to tell me who that is in a bit. I will do it. I don't think he's. I mean, that sounds nasty saying it. I don't think he's established or anything. I don't think, but. Um, he might be, um, and he's probably good. He's probably a good comic. You should have them nights. So there's nothing yeah. better than I think. It sounds really nasty saying this, but there's nothing better than watching your mate die, who's good. So like, <laughs> like you know, someone who because you know the good, so you don't feel nasty. So like, say for example, like I don't mean yours if they didn't get your character because I like your character, but I mean, I mean if it was you yourself. So you, me and you are mates. You've yeah. been to 20 gigs with me. You've smashed them all as Alex yeah, Lowe, yeah. and I'm you watching you cane it all the time. And then watching that one gig where you're going out there and, and they're not getting you. There's nothing better than being your mate on the side going, <laughs> hey, you're fucking dying here, mate. <laughs> Get him off. My thing would be that like, how do you, I mean, you know this better than me. How would you haul it, not, how would you haul yourself out of that? I don't mean you know this better than me. It just means that you've got the skills to do this. Get yourself, I don't know. I just how think, do you get yourself out of a hole? I mean... I think with me, you just eventually, you're going to get a laugh. I think in your head, you, I was talking this with Jojo Sutherland, the comedian of the oh, night, yeah. and we were talking and she said, go on. And she's very experienced and obviously started Kevin, like was with Kevin Bridges and yeah. done his tour support and Danny Sloss and all that. And, um, and she was saying that she just goes on thinking, I'm going to smash it. I'm going to... And she did smash it the other night when she was on, to be fair, she was brilliant. And, really? and like, yeah, really, and she said she just has that attitude of going on and just thinking, I'm going to smash it. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm. That's great. And yeah. Bill Burr says that. Bill Burr says, like, when's the last time you've went on in a room and thought to yourself, I'm going to go on and be that good? And it does help. For me, that does help. I've been on nights before yeah. where I thought, oh, I'm not feeling this. And I've not been myself. And then. I've done it. The reason I know this is because I've done it when I was comparing a few weeks ago. I went out first and I was thinking, they're not feeling me at all here. I'm getting little titters. Yeah. And then the second part of it, I said to the comics in the back room, I said, I'm going to go out there. Like I did with you that time. And uh, when we we're doing that yeah. little daft gig in red, I said, I'm going to smash this. Like now I'm yeah. watch these laughs here. And I say it to put the pressure on myself. And yeah, I know yeah, that yeah. everyone's going to laugh at me if I don't. So then I'm thinking, I'm going to go on. I'm being stupid. I'm that. taking the piss. Yeah. And I'm going to be funny. And I think if you go on like, Another thing I watched on Tom Segura's podcast was he was saying, if you're going in a silly mood, if you're going happy and silly, yeah, you'll yeah. have a great gig. I remember Dan Evans, he's a fantastic comic, saying he tries to enjoy the yeah. previous act. Just enjoy it. Be having a laugh. You're, in, you're a punter. You're enjoying it. And you're in a good mood when you go on. Don't be there in the wings going, shit, he's doing well. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, enjoy it. Enjoy it. <laughs> 
you know, there's so much bitterness on comedy. Like, I, I've never, I'm never like that. You know, I really, I, I'm not, and I know I'm not. No, me neither. I'm because mainly because I'm used to being with actors in a dressing room, and everyone's sort of up for it, and everyone sort of feels like it's a team effort. I can't, you know, I can. I'll tell you someone's name when I first started, who I came in the dressing room as Barry from Watford. I had all my makeup and prosthetics to do, and he sort of looked up like that. Re- you know, aggressive, cold. I went, all right. You know, it was one of my first gigs. What are you, what are you doing? You know, really not pleasant. Yeah. Just put me on the back foot. I mean, what, what, what's the point? I'm no Do threat. someone who's famous. He's oh. well, he well known, well known stand up. And it was in the days I was doing jonglers. We'll when bleep was- him up. We'll bleep him up. Obviously, bleep him up. We will. What was his name? What was it? Just so I have an idea so I can picture him in my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, and and sort of you know he started to talk to talk to me about people dying on stage and I was like yeah but comics seem to do I was that. like why are you talking about dying on stage why have you end why have you brought this up <laughs> why are you, is this just a fucking why me and he was saying something like, you know I think you know I think you die five times on stage before you give it up I'm like what why why are you talking about dying on stage I only fucking just turned up and said hello <laughs> and it was just clearly to put me on the back foot immediately what's the point. <laughs> I don't understand I'm, that. I think they get, I think people get like some sort of like, I don't know, some sort of like, I don't know, I don't know what it is. I've seen comics with other comics before. Like, I mean, I, there's, there's a lot of good people in our business as well. There's a lot, especially the ones who are higher ups. The higher up comics seem to be the ones who aren't as interested. It's the ones at the very bottom. Oh, of course. They're, they're of vile. Course. <laughs> the vile. I see comics, they're like, oh, he was but, shite, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, of course, that's always going to be the way, isn't it? If you're kind of a decent person who's well I don't know maybe that's not true there are some people at the high end who are really horrible people the, but I always think it's similar to like and I'm not dissing supporting artists extras but many times I've been sort of filming something you get talking to supporting artists and they're sort of busy and you're like yeah yeah well not, not too bad at the moment yeah it's just luck really isn't it and you go well <laughs> look if you want to give up your other job <laughs> and do what I'm doing full time yeah. then you'll see just how lucky it is. And, you know, you'll see that it's a certain amount of effort. Ke- You've presumably got other jobs. That's why you're doing this. Kevin Bridges talks about it in his autobiography. He said when he went on stage, he said he came off one time and got the biggest compliment he's ever had. And it was from a guy saying, uh, it was good that. He said, uh, but anyone can do what you're doing, just talking about, like, yourself and, and oh, life. God. And he said and he, at the time he was really insulted. And, and then he said, but... Then he thought, that's the biggest compliment, like... Because in what way? Why? Because if anyone can do it, he's doing it and absolutely smashing it with it. And and it's right. It's like someone saying to me... Yeah, yeah, Like, yeah. oh, you're doing stuff that's... You're talking about stuff that we all talk about, the lads. Yeah. The lads and, and the lasses talk about in the pubs. You're talking about that on stage. I, I go on. I'm I'm a total, like, different character to what I actually am on stage. Like, like you know my background. You want yeah, to yeah. About, you know, and... and it, it's so funny because I've never touched a drug in my life, but I talk about drugs on stage and I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I've never touched, I've not even smoked any weed or nothing. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it, actually, funnily enough, the other, but I'm still like this in, it must be my character because even in real life, I went on in Liverpool again before and it's nothing against uh, Liverpoolians. It was a great gig. I was talking, I was saying to this lad, fucking hell, he's baked off his head, isn't he? And I was going, I was going, how yeah. many bags? I'm, I said, is he doing two for one and all this? And I was going, I said, what you, What deal did you get on that? Who's the dealer here? And I'm going on about the drugs and all that. And at the end, this lad came up and he's like, fucking love that about that la. And I was like, and I was like, I was like, he was like, he went, hey, he said, I've got a bit now if you want some. And I was like, and I went, nah, I'm driving home. <laughs> I was like, I'll be awake all night, mate. You know? yeah. And then, but that's me in real life. I think I like to please people. A few weeks ago, the, the, literally a week and a half ago, there's a guy who lives opposite me and he and he smokes weed all the time. And I know because he's got his little blue. I'm not grassing him in, by the way, at the police. I think he just does it for mm. his own self. He likes weed. Yeah. And some kids walked past his house the other week and they knocked his wall over. Why, like, do you know what I think? Banged in with. Yeah, yeah. But I think it was by an accident. But they went to run off. And I turned into a typical dad. And I was like, hey, lads. Like that. And, yeah. like, and they turned around. And to be fair to them, to be fair, if it was when I was younger, we'd have ran off and, and panicked and ran off. Yeah, yeah. The lad came over and he's like, oh, I didn't meet him. I said, well, go on. I said, go and tell the guy. I said, it's, I said, it's only right to let him know. I said, just tell him it was an accident or whatever. And what are you saying? That you, did, you adopted this character of a In, kindly old neighbour? No, so, so I've done, so done this. Yeah. So when he came 
when he knocked at the lad's door, I, I don't think the guy will even watch YouTube or anything. He might do, and if he is watching it, we'll be mates after this anyway, because we've became mates now. He answered the door, and his house stunk, his house stunk of green. You know, and he came, oh, and really? he came to the door, stoned to bits, and he was like, and uh, he's a big black fella, this guy. He's like, all right, hey, that. And he's like, and the guy was like, yeah, uh, uh, I, I knocked your wall down. He went, oh, he went, oh, all right, how did that happen, son? And he said, um, my mate like pushed me into it. He went, oh, he said, it was a bit loose anyway, kid. He said, pick the bricks up. He said, now get it sorted. He said, that's nice. And he, said, and he was like, oh, sorry about that. He's like, no problem. He went, he went, all right, son. I said, sorry, mate. I said, I thought I'd just tell you. I said, I've seen it happen. I said, and, uh, and I said, uh, and instead of just leaving it at that, I went to him, like, which is very much cringy off me sometimes. I went, you just on the, having a, having a, for that. <laughs> and he was like, know. and he was like, and he was like, yeah. And I said, uh, I said, I wish I had time, you know, like that laughing. And because I've made this connection with him now, I was bringing my shopping in the other day. And he said, come in for a smoke. And I went, and, and no, I was putting the bin out or something. It was on the night time. And I was like, hey, he's got hey. grass in it. He said, hey. I know, yeah, grass in it, yeah. He said, hey. I was like, I said, hey, you made it, all right. And he's like, and he started walking towards me. And I was thinking, he's going to. And oh. for a fact, he's going to ask me. I knew. And he came over and he went to me, uh, do you want to draw? And I was like, Nah, you're right. I was thinking, what? Well, it's like paintings. Are we doing it? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I was like, it's like middle class. We've got, we've got acrylics. <laughs> he's like, and he's, yes. like, he's like, do you want to draw? And I was like, and I went, and I knew. I was like, he's like, he's like, I was like, oh, uh, nah. I said, got like, and instead of just saying, no, mate, I don't touch it. Yeah, yeah. I've never, to. I've never touched drugs in my life, but and I don't because I don't want to offend someone yeah. and say to him like, I, but I, st I should just say I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it, like. I mean, Liam, you smoke green, don't you? You love it, don't you? But like... Medicinal. Yeah. Medicinal, yeah. And, um, and I said, I said, oh, no, not tonight, mate. So I've said to him, not tonight now. Yeah. I said, got the kids. He went, he went, oh yeah, that has to be the time and place, doesn't it? And I went, yeah, mate. I went, see <laughs> and he went, and he went, right, I'm off to get fucking stoned a bit. See you later, son. Like that. And he walked off and I was like, and I walked back in, I said to me, missus, that... I'm, I'm going to end up having to go over what... I'm going to have to sit with him in the house one day, getting stoned. Oh, God. I mean, you watch even... from Going back from a lot of performers, even like... I haven't, I haven't actually watched the movie yet. The Elvis one. Have you seen the new movie? Did no. You? People were saying he was just... They were just giving him gear all the time at highs and up, uppers and downs. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. You know, just keep him performing. I mean... Johnny Cash? Johnny Cash, I've... Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, Johnny... Johnny Cash is a good singer. I like Johnny Cash, but he had a, yeah. a lot of a lot of singers and, and a lot of a lot of actors, actresses, um, comedians, performers. That there's a lot of them. After sometimes, I mean, Robbie Williams was talking. Not Robin Williams. Robbie Williams was yeah. talking about it in performance, saying that he'd go and perform at like fifty thousand people and then come back. I mean, have you ever? I know. I know. I'm, I'm sound like I'm going lawyer. Have you ever suffered from anything like depression or anything when, when you were doing? I can honestly say, touch wood. I uh, have not. Great. I, I am very kind of uh, level-headed about that stuff. Um, I don't know whether that's the right expression. Someone will shoot me down in flames, so it's nothing to do with being level-headed. No, it's not. It's right. a chemical imbalance sometimes. I don't know. Uh, luckily, I tell you when, the only time I really thought I might, I can see how you can start a slide and not pull yourself out, was during the lockdown. Yeah. Because, you know, we were touring... My Clinton show and it was going great guns. We were, you know, packing them in, and I really thought, you know, if there's anything that's going to stop that happening. It will be a problem at home with the family, or I'll lose my voice or something. And the one thing I didn't foresee was a worldwide pandemic. Like anyone, I yes. didn't think that was going to be the thing. <laughs> and if you remember at the time, it was a lot of talk of three weeks. No, everyone's going to have to stop for three weeks. Of course. Yeah. You know, we're arguably still going through it now, oh, crazy, years, isn't it? years later. And I was, I just remember, and I'm a real one for doing stuff. I can't, I, I, you know, when you get people going, oh, we're going to have a duvet day. Yeah. Or I'm, I mean, God, I can't think of anything worse than sitting around with grease on the telly for a millionth time. And you're there in a duvet going, <laughs> because I love my job. You know, if you hated your job, maybe that would be something yeah, quite yeah. nice. And it all stopped and you weren't allowed to go out. You weren't allowed to, you know, go weird, down the road. It? And it was just, it was murder. And I started to think, oh my God, just when I'm doing the very thing I want to do as a career and touring, it's not allowed to happen. And I did think then at one point, actually, I could really slip into a sort of trough of misery. Yeah. 
But I think, luckily, I've managed to haul myself do, out. Do I do you, sometimes need like a couple of days if I yeah, if yeah. something's not, if I haven't got a part, or I've you know someone's dissed me, or I don't know, I'm having a row with my wife or something, which is yeah. very very rare. I might need a couple of days to pull myself back. But I, I luckily don't just kind of slide into something and not manage to extricate myself. Because that because when I say that to you, I mean there's a lot of highs and there's a lot of lows. I mean tonight yeah. you're going on a show again tonight, big packed out show tonight. Yeah. And, and you perform and you get that adrenaline buzz and you get that and then yeah. it's like that I mean Paul Smith spoke about it on one of his um video like diaries before after yeah, yeah. His, and and I thought it's really it, like it was good that he spoke about it afterwards because he, he was it wasn't just showing the, the the buzz and he was talking about when he's went on there and he's done two massive shows yeah yeah and then afterwards he was just saying how he felt like I mean I've had it don't get me wrong it's like sometimes you're like it's always the sun usually I know you're doing a you're doing a gig tonight Sunday yeah. It's usually the Sunday if you've done like a Thursday, Friday, Saturday of big gigs. Go on. And then you go the Sunday and you're like, you're like, oh, like the adrenaline's coming down now. And it's like, and then you suddenly like, you, your legs feel heavy and you, but I've never that had that. That could happen tonight. Yeah. We just I've, had a long week. I'm just thinking well, about that tonight. I've never, I've never had like, don't get me wrong. I've, I've, I've had the points where I was going, but that was through certain points in my life when I was going through bad times. I remember, and yeah. Um, but performance wise, I mean, now I've, I don't know if it's the same for you. I try and, I mean, I know you like to get like a, a little drink after a show. Or like, no, not like, no, like, I'm not <laughs> I know you like to have a little. <laughs> oh, come on, <laughs> I know you like to have a little drink. <laughs> you know, you like, yeah, I know you like four whiskeys yeah. after a show. <laughs> no, but do you, what do you think the best thing for after a show is? Do you like, for me, it's, it's, if I've got like, so if I'm, if I'm not gigging the next night, I want to get home to family, yeah. to be honest. So I, yeah. I'll travel home and I'll, because I know that it'll, the drive will sort of tire me out on the way home. Yeah. And I think I'll get Absolutely. home. And my adrenaline's down when I get yeah. in and I get straight to bed. But whereas I used to, when I first started, I used to sit up and analyze. Now I just sort of try and switch off. But sometimes right. there's them gigs where you're just fucking wired. Okay. So doing this tour, what normally happens is we go back, have a quick drink. And, you know, <laughs> the fact is we're normally, let's be <laughs> fair, in really some. Drink. Premier in off yeah, yeah. the M6, yeah. so it, it's not like you know you go there. It's all a bit grim, <laughs> and then I quite often have a bath. Yeah, yeah. I have a bath. I've got some terrible middle aged music. Oh, I like all. What music, what's so, your favourite music? Oh God! No, I'm, tell me because I bet you I like it. I've got a new thing that I'm into now. Because I, I look, I'm wearing Sketches. Yeah. I'm an old man now. I don't give two shits. Yeah. And what is on my iTunes? iTunes. They are. That's that's how yeah. old I am. iMusic. What's it called? Yeah, iTunes. Apple iTunes, Music. I've, Apple, I've, yeah. uh, Apple Music is um, my new thing. <laughs> so embarrassing that I'm into now, which <laughs> is <laughs> right now. Yeah. <laughs> which is? Do you know Kate Rusby? No. What type of singer is she? It's like. This is the kicker. This will all. This will. This is what they always say about folk music. Eventually, they'll. Eventually, they'll get you. They'll get you in the end. When when the time comes, you don't give a shit what anyone thinks. You'll go. Oh, I like the sound of that. That's a nice melodic thing. Yeah. And it's a woman with a lovely, clear voice, beautiful harmonies, and Kate Rusby is my new thing, and it's like kind of modern folk music. Uh, no, that's not. <laughs> that's, no, that's this I, week. I, 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 like folk music. music. Well, obviously, yeah, look, look, increasingly, look, look, that's what I like. Luke Combs is my favourite artist, the one I told yeah, you about before. That's right. And then I've, I've, you're going to take the piss even more here. When I've started, you said Swan Lake earlier on, I've started listening to. You know, going to gigs? Start listening to orchestra. Yeah, and, yeah, and, that's quite nice. Just, just a chill to in the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know, like, like and. Um, yeah. And then every now and again, I'm like, oh, I know this one. I was just going to say, I just want to drag you back to one other thing that. When you say about, you know, after gigs, you know, normally when I get, quite often if it's just a gig and I've got to drive home, as you say, it's a long drive home. Yep. And I have LBC on or one of these chat things in the car. And very soon I've kind of forgotten about the gig and my adrenaline's gone down. But what I will say about the sort of depression and the highs and lows of the thing is that I've had an awful lot of just about to hit the jackpot stuff in my career. Yep. And that is something that's taken a little bit of getting used to. You know, I did a an HBO pilot with Steve Coogan, directed by Justin Theroux, produced by Ben Stiller. Yeah. Which was going was kind of the idea was it was the forerunner to uh what's it called? Something fever. 
uh, it was a, it was a thing he did. Oh God, I can't remember. Anyway, it was it was um, a a forerunner to a film, a big film that Steve Coogan did. Yep. And um, I've you know like I did this thing that not many people saw on Channel Four, thirty episodes called Cheap 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 with Noel Edmonds, where I played Barry from Watford. Yeah, yeah. Which came and went. No one seemed to see. It's unbelievable. It was on Channel Four. Yeah, I remember. No, I remember you telling me. And right, I remember seeing and it, it came and went, and that was a, that was going to be a game show that that we did so many episodes of films I've done, which have just come and gone. Mm. You know, I did a film called Haunted, which was going to be a big thing. And it sort of didn't do anything at the box office. Time after time after time, there's been great opportunities (laughs) that just have not quite happened. And those are things which have taken a bit of a, you know, body blow and think, you know, once again, something didn't quite come off. You know, the Peter Serafinowicz show we did for BBC Two was going to be a massive thing. And that came and went, and there was talk of us touring it around the country. Uh, Claire and the community I did for Radio 4, we were going to do a West End run of that. Yeah. All these things sort of didn't quite happen. Jobs I was about to do. And um, that has been quite a difficult thing, which is why, you know, I, I've said it before in, in interviews, not that I do tons of interviews, but, you know, podcasts and things, that, you know, now, look, we've got this equipment, yeah, we can come and do this. You can actually put stuff out. It's really great to be living in 2022, where there's the capacity to just produce your own stuff and get it out there. You're not waiting, yeah, endlessly for some board at the BBC to get you in and and, think, and have a production meeting about a meeting about a meeting. I think that's why people are liking podcasts so much because they're so real and there's no like there's yeah. no like the oh, you can't say this and you can't say that. It's just like and people are that's right. They just they're just like oh, and if people want to watch it and listen to it, they will. Yep. So there's no great, you know, arbiter of taste at the BBC telling people what they can and can't have. Yeah. Because you can put it out there. And, you know, I've put out little Clinton Baptiste videos that have had huge viewings or, yep. you know, funny little odds and sorts. You know, Barry from what for doing uh, the Minty Biscuits thing. Yeah, yeah. Or Barry does a voiceover. You know, it's like millions and millions of hits of this thing. Yeah, definitely. And so, you know, it's lovely to be in that position. I mean, before obviously you go, I want to. There's two things I wanted to say. One of them was one of my favourite stories, which you, Liam won't know because it'll be more funny telling Liam. Was the time you got chased off stage? Oh bloody hell! <laughs> you know, I just went, is that what, not because what would you say? That's one of your worst moments in stand up in life. <laughs> <laughs> what be that's been killed by someone? Yeah. Was it, would you say that's your worst in stand up? Uh, the uh, worst moments in stand up. I've got to tell you, when I used to do Barry from Watford, and I used to do Jonglers. Yep. As I say, coming from an acting background, I didn't know anything about comedy. I didn't jonglers. Really, and I thought, oh, jonglers, that is, that's the place to go, you know? It's yeah. like, that is a comedy venue. That's where people go. And I'd grown up with that in the 80s, being a slightly alternative yeah, yeah. kind of venue. But when I got to do it in the sort of 2010, 2011, 2012 sort of period, it was a real stags and hens yeah. thing. People... You know, you could buy a package that involved doing paintballing. Then you go to this fucking jongler's place where there's some comedy. <laughs> then there's like chicken in a basket. And then there's cheap drinks and disco. Yeah. So for some people, the comedy was the bit they didn't want, you yeah, know. Yeah. So you're coming out on stage, there's people going, oh, come on, let's get to the getting off with some birds at the disco, you know. Yeah, yeah. So you come out and you and I'm doing my nicely observed Barry from Watford character yeah. with, with all the detail. And there's just and a prosthetic face. So some people are just going, what the fuck is this? Who's that bloke? Oh, my God, what's this? And you're an answer. Hello, good evening. And they're not interested in comedy or your nicely observed take on old men. And particularly what I didn't realise is you go anywhere in the country outside of London and there's this ridiculous parochial thing like, you know, you know, where are you from? London. What's this London bloke doing uh, comedy? And, and all the jokes are about, oh, you're from fucking Birmingham. And this, you know, and I just thought, oh, God, I didn't realise that was a thing. that Because my character had a, a Cockney accent. Yeah. Immediately, that's a barrier. Oh, fucking listen to this Cockney twat. You know, it's like, <laughs> look, it's just, I'm just doing some jokes, right? <laughs> so that was horrible. And, yeah. and I swear to God, I got some alopecia as a result. Yeah. I, I honestly and my hair started falling out. It was so stressful. And you know, you just have kind of morons there and yeah. and certain comedians great <laughs> at doing the sort of you're very good at this stuff. Troubleshooting, crowd control, 
Not my thing at all. It's like, this is what I've written, crafted, shut up, please listen to what I'm doing. And I'm not good when, you know, there's yeah, yeah. women screaming and, you know, throwing punches like that happened to you. Um, so that was the one thing. But the, the thing, that the, one of the really terrible ones as Clinton was what you're alluding to uh, a few what, years what ago. What happened? What happened? So I went to a school in Winchester, very posh school, yeah. to do this gig. And it was a um, it was a PTA gig at the the King School Winchester, which is not a public school, but it's a very posh school in a very posh area. And my agent, who I, I just joined, who'd never actually seen me doing my acts, I think he knew me from various things and took me on. Bless him, Paul Baker, who's a brilliant agent. And I went to uh, do this gig, and there was there was people like uh, oh god, what's his bloody James Gill. Yep. He's a very good compare. He was on. There was Mike Cox was on. There was someone else on. And I was headlining this yep. gig. There must have been 300 people there on tables in this massive hall. Maybe, yeah, maybe, let's say 300 people yeah, yeah. on tables. And cabaret style. Cabaret style, raising money for their school. Not comedy people. Yeah. Their, their, their parents, their teachers, their governors who were there to raise money for the school. And I said to my agent, look, I'm not going to be dropping the F-bombs. It doesn't feel right. They're yeah, all yeah. quite posh. Let's just... And James Gill, my agent, went, play, do your normal set. Just do your normal set. It's fine. I promise you. Someone's already said, fuck out there. You'll be all right. You can see where this is going. So yeah. I said, <laughs> I said, all right, all right. You know, but it doesn't feel right. He said, I promise you, all these posh people out here, once they've had a few drinks, that all relaxes. All right. So I went out there. James Gill introduced me, disappeared. I went out there. Yeah, right. All this sort of stuff. And immediately a bloke fairly near the front went, Jackal. Like, can you contact Michael Jackson? Yeah. So I went, all right, I'll come to you in a minute. Carried on. And there's a bit I do in lots of shows, if I need to, which is, I said, so, I, which is a horrible thing to say, really, but it always gets a big laugh. I found my way to this guy. I said, now, where, who wanted Michael Jackson? You, yes. I said, what's your name, man? And he said, Pascal. So I said, all right, he's French. I said, and it's a thing I often do. Yeah, Pascal, someone called Dave says you're a cunt. Right, big laugh, yeah. and it's followed by a sharp intake, intake of breath. And I looked around, I, I, come on, I thought, he's not taking that very well. Yeah, and I thought, yeah. it might be in my imagination. I carried on, went round. There's another little bit I do where I got back on the stage, and I sort of, you know, after speaking to lots of people in the audience, and I said, um, you know, there's nothing extraordinary about my skills. It's a fact. In any group of people, 78% will have extraordinary brain skills speaking to pascal just now i'm after to revise it down a little bit for this audience right <laughs> and it was that really vanilla joke <laughs> that tipped him over the edge yeah and he starts going all this french swearing i thought fuck 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 and his wife is going sit down to him sit down to him and i suddenly thought you know what i've called in the c word which you know, in England, in comedy clubs, it's all knockabout. It's all up for grabs. Yeah, yeah. It's a term of affection quite yeah, yeah. often. Yeah, of course But this guy, I imagine, quickly thinking, in France, that is an absolute no-no. I, You know, I've really insulted him. Yeah. And so I kind of, the audience is shouting at him, sit down, shut up, you know, and he, so there's a bit of a shouting match going on. All this stuff's going on. Yeah. So I said, I said, to be fair, to, I try to make light of it. You know, it, honestly, ladies and gentlemen, please, no, it's all right. There, I'm sorry, Pascal. There is, a, it's, a, it's clearly a difference in culture. You have some culture. I don't. Didn't really work. Keeps going. So I was going, I couldn't, I just couldn't shut everyone up shouting. So I said, um, Pascal, look, I don't speak French, but something tells me you're not very happy. I'm picking that up. Carries on shouting. So in the end, I just went, Look, ladies and gentlemen, I, can't, I don't know what to... I've apologised twice now. I don't know what else to do. Reluctantly, I'm just... I can't I can't really do it with this shouting going on. So, good night. I hope you make a lot of money for the charity. Yeah. And um, I'm going to go. So, good night. And I got off the stage. I'd only done 10 minutes. I was supposed to do 20, 25 minutes. And as I got off the stage, Pascal gets oh, up to make his way... Was he a big bloke? What did he look like? Oh, he's 20 years younger than me. Big yeah, guy, yeah. you know. I mean... Also, clearly unhinged that he would do this in front of 300 yeah, contemporaries yeah. in his kid's school. 
Yeah, witnesses who couldn't. So I was there, stood there, and I thought for a minute, I'm not going to run away. This is ridiculous. It's a comedy gig. I'm wearing a blonde wig, it's a ridiculous <laughs> white silk outfit. I, you can't think I'm being serious, surely. And all this goes through my mind. I suddenly thought, do you know what? Suddenly I thought, these people have not shut him up. What am I going to do? So I turned and left it out of the room. Down the corridor, and just as I came out, James Gill, who's comparing, came out the toilet, went, fucking hell, who's on the stage, you know? <laughs> and I got down the corridor, and as is the way with everywhere now, I couldn't get into any of the classrooms. They were all sort of, dun, 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 yeah, you know? yeah. And I was going, oh my God, I couldn't get anywhere. And I, I was running down these corridors, could hear him coming. And you still have I, your wig on? I still had all my gear on, wig, and I had a sort of glittery bag that I was running with. <laughs> and I heard my agents sort of rugby tackle him and James Gill yeah. get him on the ground. He was going, where is he? Where is Father Christmas? <laughs> so I don't know why Father Christmas, I don't think he understood what I was doing, <laughs> clearly. And I got behind this sort of filing cabinet and I was there going, and at the time I was laughing. I thought it was so ridiculous. I thought, oh, quick, took off the wig and a couple of things. And a woman came out to me and said she was the head of security and she had a very dry mouth like she was terrified of the whole thing and she said do you, do you want to wait till everyone goes home before you leave i thought fuck that i don't want to get into the car park on my own there's no one around and pascal is stood there so i went no no i'm going yeah, when everyone else is going yeah <laughs> so um basically um i came back and the whole evening finished early you know because i just ended it and they gave me a box of um, Quality Street, like I'd run it, won it in the raffle, looked no. like a, a, one of the parents. <laughs> I put all my stuff in the bag and someone came out. And it reminded me of, you know, when from about the age of, say, 13 to about 21, when you go out, there's always a chance it might kick off. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I've yeah. been out, you know, that thing when you're younger, don't look now, but someone's screwing us out. At yeah, the bar. yeah, yeah. You know, that yeah, sort yeah, of yeah, yeah, horror. And I, and I was about 52 at the time, yeah. thinking, I don't need this. Why am I putting out this? And I got in the car park, and he was there, and it was a sort of just like that. Keep walking, keep walking. He's just over there. I was like, fucking hell, I don't want this. I got in the car, sped off down the road. I was still thought it was quite funny, you know. And then said, and, au revoir, dickhead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And I got into, pulled into a bus stop, realised I was completely about a mile in the wrong direction, didn't know where I was. And I phoned my wife, and I was kind of laughing. And I drove home, didn't think anything of it. And literally, a day later, I was at football watching Wolves with my lad. And suddenly, like, all I could think of, it was just going over and over. It was like PTSD in my head. Yeah. That that guy was going to kill me. You know, he was not going to be stopped. He had to be sort of physically stopped. Yeah. If he'd have found me, I would have been absolutely pummeled. I have no doubt about that. Yeah, yeah. You know, he was the sort of anger and this kind of swearing. And, you know, being held back... You know, when right, I think about it now, his wife was holding on to him. And I thought at the time, this is so ridiculous. I thought, you know, but actually it nearly came down to him. If he'd come a bit further down the corridor, I would have been murdered, I, I, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's all I could think about. I was just at football. I couldn't concentrate on the match thinking, my God, that was, that was a real close one. Yeah. So that's why it's so nice to go and do a tour now where people sort of know, who know you what are. Clinton's about and, uh, you know... I mean, your tour, obviously, we'll wrap it up now. I mean, your tour, you, you want to... If you haven't seen Alex before, <clears throat> I'm not just saying it because he's here. As I've said it to Liam before, so it's everyone. Everyone who hasn't seen Alex, you're a great, great actor to go and see. And Ramon, obviously. I've not seen you with Ramon yet, though. I've not seen you with... And no, how, no. How is you're coming going? tonight. I'll come and watch, yeah. Yeah, great, great. Yeah, I'll great. come and watch, definitely. Um, but um, I was going to say, every time I've watched you, I've never not... I've never not seen you absolutely smash it. Like, but you're, you're going to, how many more dates have you got touring now? Tons. <laughs> so probably, we, we will put them up on here, won't we? We'll yeah. Put the foot, we'll put a link. We'll, we'll put, we'll, we'll, okay, well, we, we probably got, uh, I think, probably about 18 to go. We've probably done 30 odd. Yep. Uh, and then I'm doing a little charity one for Jason Cook in yep. Newcastle at the end. Then that's it. So finish the 11th of December. Then it starts again, doesn't it? Well, I'm going to... You're going to have a break. I'm going to have a break. Then I'm starting again yep. in in a year or so's time. Yeah. You're going Provided to make... people still want to come and see No, me. they will. You, they, I, I mean, so. you're one of them comics that you change your material constantly. 
So, which is oh, great. Yeah, you can't keep going out on tour and doing the same joke. <laughs> that would be terrible. <laughs> yeah, so which is great. It's great. Obviously, like I say, I've, I've seen you. I've seen your act what ten times, and every time I've seen it, it's been different. And that's even like with improvisation okay. stuff. It's always been great. Clinton Baptiste, Alex Lowe. I'm saying Clinton Baptiste, Alex Lowe who performs as many different characters, voice actor, and go and see his show. Go and see Clinton Baptiste show. Go and see it. It's the best Thank one of the best shows much. out there. Um, thanks for coming on today. You've been thanks great. for having me. It's so nice. Anyone's interested? No, and you, like I say, you appreciate like, it. There's so many, so many people who love your stuff, and and they'll realise that if they go and see you, hopefully you won't get any more trolls from it. The bigger you're getting, though, them trolls are going to keep coming. Aren't I don't they? want any more trolls, right? <laughs> Not any French trolls. He's touring in Paris. <laughs> touring in Paris. <laughs> oh Christ! Yeah, no, I don't like the trolling. Please stop that. Yeah, I don't like that. I, I, I think. Just, Having said that just before we go, the trolling thing is, I don't think you've ever got anything to worry. It's always someone with like a shit picture, like we said. Yeah. They never yeah. have a proper picture, do they? It's always like a picture of a no, dog. No, that's right. It's just it's like you think, well, who is this? And they've just got a series of, you know, Christmas scapes or something on their Facebook page. <laughs> yeah. Or a Union Jack. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, there's a bit of that. So, there's a so, bit of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I've got to say very quickly... The vast, vast, vast majority of people are very nice to me. But it's just so funny that on this tour, I've just had a handful of people. And it must be just because the law of averages says if more people finding out about it, you're just going to get a few weirdos. But it's a really strange thing for the first time ever. I'm going, really? What, what have I done? They're so terrible, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, it's just... Yeah, exactly. Done something you're doing. You're doing a lot better than a lot of other people. One of the nicest, and I'll, I'll say this before you go, you're one of the nicest people on the circuit and one of the best comics on the circuit. So thanks very much for coming on. Thanks and, for having me. Go and see Clinton Baptiste's show. Go and, go and follow, if you're not following him, follow him and you'll love it. Yeah. I'm a super nice guy. We finished. You fucking ever do that to me again. You just fucking hate French people. <laughs> just, right, that'll be 500 pounds, please. Let's go. <laughs>